Good morning. Well, it wasn't bad. <laughs> welcome to everybody worshiping with us this morning. Uh, special welcome to any guests worshiping with us. Um, if you're a guest, we ask that you fill out one of these connect cards that are located in the pew just in front of you, and then as you leave today, if you would please place that in the offering plate by the exit doors. We have one announcement this morning. Uh, immediately after the morning worship, there will be a deacon bylaw question and answer in room 407, which is the Crusaders room located in the upper level to the right there. So just keep that in mind. And now, if you would please stand. I'm going to read for a call to worship uh, from Psalm 19, verses 7 and 8. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Good morning. It's so good to see you all. I'm, uh, just remain standing with us while we sing these songs and praise to our God.
night. Will you please remain standing with me as we go before our Lord in prayer. I will read the leader portion, and then if you would read the responsive portion after that. Living God, <clears throat> thank you for allowing me to see the dark areas of my heart, that I have sorrow for the sins that carry me away from you. In my sin, I either look on my faults and am discouraged, or I look on my good and am prideful. I fall short of your glory every day by spending hours on worthless things and by thinking the things that I do are good when they are not done for your glory or when they do not spring from the truths of your word. I often forget to submit to your will, but scripture teaches me that you have a purpose for me. This quiets my soul and causes me to love you. Cause me to never trust my own heart, but instead that I would trust in the grace of your Son, Jesus. Amen. We serve such a good God who, in his grace and kindness, has covered our sin in Jesus Christ. We can be affirmed and assured of our forgiveness in him because of that. So let's sing of that now.
sí, sí. Notice how Liz asked you to be seated so I didn't keep you standing for the next 25 minutes. Thank you for that. So before I pray today, I just would like you to know that I will be finishing the prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Um, and it's going to be a little different than what we've been used to. So when I prompt you, if you would pray with me, that would be awesome. Please pray with me. Our dear Father in heaven, the heavens declare your glory. The sky above proclaims your handiwork. Thank you for your perfect law. Please use it to make us wise. Thank you for you. Thank you for your truth and righteousness. Let our thoughts and speech be acceptable in your sight. Thank you, Jesus, for being our rock and our redeemer. Thank you, Lord, for your love and mercy on us. Please forgive us when we sin against you and help us to hold each other accountable in love to one another. Help us, Lord, to pray for one another and to speak with love and kindness towards each other. Thank you, Lord, for our church body here in Hingham, and thank you for the people you've called to join today. Please help each of us to use our gifts to become one body, the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, and each of one another. Help us to be patient and forgiving of one another, and to all partner together in the gospel to advance your kingdom. Thank you for your many ministries here, and please bless each one. Today we ask you to be with our sick. Please comfort them, and if, it be, and if it be your will, we ask for healing. Please remember the family of Ralph Dykstra and give them comfort in knowing he is with you in heaven. Please also, Lord, be with Virgil, and Larry, and Barb, and Ashley, and Carol, and Carl, and Connie, Anne, Cora, Liz, John, Anne, Faye, Harvey, Sue, and Gloria. Hingham Church, please pray with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Thank you, Kurt. I also want to just say a quick thanks to uh, especially Todd and David as they were getting those screens that were giving us a tough time at the start today, getting those online. Technology is one of those things that's really wonderful when it works. And uh, so thank you guys for, for uh, bearing with that. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's a really a joy for me to see you all, uh, more than it is to see the, that the screens are working. I want to tell you all today that I am going to pull some shenanigans uh, during the sermon time here, uh, but I want to announce the shenanigans up front, okay? So first, today, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to preach through Psalm 19. I'd love it if you would turn there in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you today, there's one in front of you. Grab that, turn to Psalm 19. Psalms is right in the middle, usually, of those Bibles. Um, and, you know, at Hingham Church, we are always at work to center ourselves on the Word of God. And so as I preach through Psalm 19, I'm going to unpack its basic meaning for you to help us think through it. Uh, but then I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask, was that a faithful Christian treatment of Psalm 19? And you need to know, this is the shenanigans part, all right, you need to know in advance that right now the answer to that question is going to be no, okay? Was that a faithful Christian treatment of Psalm 19? The answer is no. No matter uh, how 
well you think I have handled Psalm 19 at that point, no matter how amazing the new insights you've gained from it are, uh, no matter how much you love me, okay, you just need to remember that the answer to that question is going to be no. And the reason is because I will not yet have given you what is the most crucial component of Psalm 19. I'm not going to give you false information. I'm not going to tell you anything that's not true. I'm going to believe everything that I tell you this morning, but something very crucial is going to be missing that I will explain after that point. And then I will spend the final portion of the message explaining exactly what I left out, why it's so easy to leave that out, and why it's absolutely crucial that we never leave it out. And so I'm not really trying to pull any shenanigans today. I'm just trying to uh, help engage your mind with some of these things in a little bit different way. I'm trying to convey something to you that I believe is the most important truth about the Bible that you'll ever come across. So if you would, uh, please follow along with me as I read Psalm 19. To the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is God's word for us today. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. Please use it to transform our hearts by your grace and by your spirit. Amen. All right, let's take a look at these first six verses here, uh, which talk about nature's declaring or declaration of the glory of God. Uh, Creation in verses 1 and 2 and verses 4 through 6. So basically all of them except for verse 3 here uh, really speak to this end. You know, creation is, is really a pretty amazing thing, isn't it? Uh, when, when your senses get to experience the created universe, you, you perceive the design of God everywhere and in everything you come across. Just consider the visual beauty of creation. Just consider what your eyes can perceive. It doesn't matter whether you use just the naked eye or whether you use a telescope or a microscope. Creation is amazingly beautiful, whether it's the the, uh, beauty of the distant stars and planets or the beauty of an intricate snowflake that falls from the sky, creation is pouring forth speech about its creator. But then we see in verse 3, there's a little bit of a disruption to what the other verses in these first six are talking about here. Virtually all all of the translations uh, in English Uh, including the ESV that I just read out of, actually add a word to the original Hebrew text here uh, in verse 3. They add the word whose. Whose. And they do that to help this verse fit the flow and fit the the meaning of the other five verses in this section. Uh, Without this word, verse 3 kind of stands alone, actually, apart from the other verses, and it actually sounds like it's contradicting them. At the very least, without the word whose, the flow of the passage is really disrupted. And I actually think that's the point. I think this is done by David very artfully. This major disruption 
to the flow of these first six verses is meant to draw the reader's attention, and it makes an impact on the overall meaning of this first subsection, these first six verses. So the New American Standard actually, I think, translates it the right way. They translate verse 3 without inserting any extra words into the original Hebrew, and they translate it this way. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their voice is not heard. Okay? Now, I think that actually the New American Standard's right. Uh, I don't think it contradicts the other verses, but I do think it's making a really significant point for us. Uh, creation is constantly pouring out speech. It's constantly declaring the glory of God. But what are we doing with it? What does humanity do with that? We suppress it in our unrighteousness. You know, when my kids were little, uh, we uh, put in each of their bedrooms uh, white noise machines, right? Uh, We did that because we couldn't always control the noises uh, coming in from outside of their bedrooms, and it just kind of helped to drown out any other noise that, that might be going on. And it worked really well. Like, they, for a while, they couldn't even go to sleep without their white noise machine going on. It sort of just suppressed all of those other sounds. That's what verse 3 is telling us. Our sin natures drown out creation's declaration of the glory of God. We, we hear noise, but it's broken up and it's made unintelligible because of our sin. And if it sounds like I'm getting the, uh, the language of suppressing the truth and unrighteousness from somewhere else, it's because I am. If you wouldn't mind turning to Romans chapter 1, I'm going to have you turn a couple of places in your Bible this morning, so you'll want to keep it handy. Romans chapter 1, uh, we're going to see that the Apostle Paul talks about this idea of natural revelation or of God's Uh, self-declaration through creation of his own glory. Okay, Paul picks this up in Romans 1, verse 18. And this is what he says there. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. What truth? For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to to, to them. How has he shown it to them? For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. Where? In the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. What do we do with that truth? For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Did you catch all of that? Creation displays very plainly some truths about God, such as His eternal power and His divine nature. But what do we do with those things as we perceive them? We suppress them. Creation actually removes any excuses that we might have in our rejection of God, in our self-honoring rather than our honoring of God. We know God, but we don't truly know Him. We're, we become, instead of honoring God, we become inflamed with pride. We, we honor ourselves instead of God. We worship earthly things, and we become fools. We become fools because no matter how smart we become, no matter how many PhDs we might get under our belt, no matter how much training we might have in our particular field, we know nothing Apart from Christ, we know nothing. How can I say that? Well, because to understand anything rightly, we have to understand what it is. And unless we understand everything around us, everything in creation, as first and foremost the creation of God, we have not yet begun to understand it. No matter how hard creation cries out to us, our sinful hearts take that natural revelation, and they mix in so much white noise that there is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. And that's where special revelation comes in and helps out, or at least it can. Uh, We see in verses 7 through 11, back now in Psalm uh, chapter 19, that 
Creation has declared the glory of God in the first six verses, and now God himself, through special revelation, through his word, is also going to declare his glory. We see that in verses 7 through 11. First of all, in verses 7 through 9, we see five benefits of God's word. Uh, First of all, benefit number one, God's word revives the soul. We see that in the first part of verse 7, meaning it's refreshing to those of us who receive it by faith. It's a cold drink of water on a blisteringly hot day. It's the steak and potatoes dinner that someone else has prepared for you after a long, hard day of work. It's, It's refreshing. God's word in the second part of verse 7 also makes wise the simple. Remember how our darkened hearts have deceived us and and turned us into fools who stupidly worship creation rather than the Creator. God's Word, as it's received by faith, actually reverses that process. And you may think you're smart, but if you don't know God, according to His Word, you are a fool and you are deceiving yourself. Proverbs 1.7 tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And guess what the best source of wisdom and instruction is? It's God's Word. So if you despise the Scriptures, God calls you a fool. Why? Because if you do not fear God, you are without any real knowledge. Who wants that? You know, I I know I always want to be the one that has the right answer. I don't like being wrong. Nobody wants to be wrong. Uh, But without a relationship with God, we are always wrong. Thirdly, God's Word rejoices the heart. We see that in verse 8. It brings joy to the heart. Do you lack joy? Think on what God has done for you based on what we're shown in Scripture. Knowing God and meditating on Him brings joy to my heart. If you love God and you know how much He loves you, you can't help but want to hear from Him in His Word. Benefit number four, God's Word enlightens the eyes. We see that in the second part of verse 8. God gave us the sun for our physical eyes to see, and God gives us the Scriptures to enlighten our spiritual eyes so that we can see spiritual truths. The author of Psalm 119 says in one place, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's been turned into a children's song. I grew up singing that song. It's a a wonderful song to teach uh, our kids to implant in their minds. You know, because of sin, we become futile or meaningless or purposeless in our thinking. And we, we read Paul say that back in Romans chapter 1, and, and then he goes on to say that our foolish hearts were darkened. God's Word, we're told here, uh, it, well, actually in verse, uh, in Psalm 119, excuse me, gives light to our eyes. And also here in Psalm 19, gives light to our eyes. The fifth benefit of God's Word. God's Word brings cleansing, verse 9, from unrighteousness. The language of ceremonial cleanness or uncleanness is something that would have meant more to the ancient Jews than uh, it might mean to many of us today, but God's Word, again, His special revelation is what teaches us the pathway to come into relationship with God so that we can worship Him, so that we can be a part of the community of faith. Now, uh, we see in verses 10 and 11 that obedience to God's Word brings blessing. Uh, This could almost function as a sixth benefit of God's Word, but I've separated it out because the psalmist begins to get more at our reception of God's Word. What, What I'm getting at is that we're not made righteous just because we read these words. Our hearts have to be engaged in order for God's Word to actually bless us. This is why we so often emphasize participation in worship, uh, because just being here doesn't convey blessing. Reception of God's Word by faith into our souls is a sure and certain way to blessing. And then the last subsection Verses 12 through 14, so nature is declaring the glory of God. God himself is declaring the glory of God through his word. And then this final section, the psalmist himself, David himself, desires to declare God's glory. 
Uh, I'll be brief on this point because uh, we've covered so many of the ideas that are present in these verses in in other messages in the series. Uh, Just note that the author here, King David, recognizes his own failure to appropriately declare the glory of God. So his desire is to be justified, it's to be cleansed before God, it's to be protected from serious moral failure so that his thoughts and his words would be acceptable there in verse 14 in God's sight. Again, he just wants to join with creation and join with God himself in declaring the glory of God. This is something we should all aspire to do. Okay, that's it. So that's the first part of the message, right? And so the question that I said uh, that I would ask you is, is this, but again, I believe everything that I've said so far, fully believe it, but, but here's the question. Were I to stop right there, would that be a faithful Christian treatment of Psalm 19? And the answer is? Okay, good. all right. But what's really important is why that's not a faithful Christian treatment, right? So let's talk about that, okay? Uh, I want to use a different lens, right? Some of you wear glasses, some of you wear contacts, you're looking through a lens. I want to look through a different lens now as we approach Psalm 19. I want us to think again about these first six verses here. Um, Again, everything I've said so far, I believe is fully true, and yet it is insufficient, is insufficient if I were to say no more. Verses one and two, and verses four through six, we see that creation is screaming all kinds of truth about the Creator, and yet verse 3 stands in opposition to that. It's because of the curse on creation that we don't hear truth about God, and this is a result of Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden. This is what holds us back from knowing God through His revelation in nature. We're going to see also in verses 7 through 11 uh, that that's what makes the law of the Lord so important. Uh, His first special revelation to Moses, right, Uh, and then also to others, it it, it makes special revelation so valuable because it's that special revelation that, that revives the soul, that gives wisdom, that rejoices the heart, that enlightens the eyes, etc., because it, it breaks through all the white noise, okay? Now, we don't just see an amazing world and, and say to ourselves, gee, this is amazing stuff. How did this all come about? We don't do that anymore. Now, we know, because it's been revealed to us, that it was created by a creator. And, and we're instructed that his name is Yahweh. And he desires to bless his people, starting with Abraham and and Abraham's descendants. God's special revelation tells us that creation is under a terrible curse because of our forefather Adam's sin. And very importantly, God's special revelation tells us how we can live lives which are pleasing to him so that we can have joy and purpose. And then lastly, we see David. So, Adam, Moses, and David are all emphasized in this, I believe. That's the effect, at least here, on King David himself in verses 12 through 14. He is confessing. He's seeking forgiveness. He's seeking protection from God uh, from gross sin. He's praying for innocence. He's really just praying for a, a return to humanity's naturally innocent state in Eden. And he knows God personally now. He's not just some unknown, distant creator He's David's rock and his redeemer, he calls him in verse 14. But friends, even in saying all of these things, we are missing the main point of Psalm 19. Do you realize that nothing I've said so far, nothing I've said so far, except I misspoke one time, I slipped up one time, but nothing I've said so far would be disagreeable to a Jewish person Nothing I've said so far would be disagreeable to a Jewish person. I've said nothing that a faithful Jew could not affirm. And I, I want to be really clear on this point. Failure to point to Jesus in a sermon means that the message is not a truly Christian message. I accidentally said Jesus earlier in the sermon, but that was a slip. That wasn't intentional. Failure to point to Jesus in a sermon means that that message 
is not a truly Christian message. So in answer to our original question, was that a faithful Christian treatment of Psalm 19? The answer is no, because Jesus was absent. And it makes sense, doesn't it? It, It's hard for us to consider it Christian if there is no Christ in the message. Let me try to anticipate pushback. Some of you, I'm sure, immediately agree with what I'm saying, but I don't want to assume that everyone does. So uh, let me just present a potential counter-argument to what I've just said. Some of you might be saying, well, but Jesus isn't mentioned in Psalm 19. So how is it unfaithful to preach what's there and Jesus isn't there? Well, that's a great question that's worth more than a month of Sundays to unpack. In fact, I actually try to answer that question every time I preach on a text that doesn't mention Jesus' name, uh, though I'm not always as direct about it as I'm being today. You know, there's a lot of texts that do mention Jesus by name, uh, and there's a lot that don't, especially in the Old Testament. But I firmly believe that every Christian treatment of every biblical text must include that text's connection to Jesus Christ and to His gospel. That is the essence, you might say, of gospel centrality. So if I were to preach Psalm 19 to you this morning without speaking to you about Christ, then I might as well be a Jewish rabbi, not a Christian preacher of the gospel. But I take my cues from places like Luke 24. You should turn there if you have your Bible handy, Luke chapter 24. Uh, Because that's where Jesus himself does this very thing that I'm talking about. Luke chapter 24, uh, verses starting in verse 44, Jesus there is talking, this is after the resurrection, he's talking to his disciples. And he interprets to his disciples in all the scriptures, by the way, back then all the scriptures was the Old Testament, okay? In all the Scriptures, the things concerning Himself. Check this out. Luke 24, verse 44. Then He said to them, These are My words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about Me in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And He said to them, Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Did you see the mention of the Psalms there? Even the Psalms, which don't mention Jesus by name, are all about Jesus. They were written to teach us about Jesus. Brothers and sisters, let your soul cling to that. Always and forever remind yourself that every text in Scripture is first and foremost about your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And okay, just to, just to shut the door on any potential counter-arguments to this, I, I want to consider another thought. Um, if someone really wanted to argue that my treatment of Psalm 19 was just fine, even without a mention of Jesus, uh, maybe they would say something like, well, sure, perhaps some of the Psalms point us to Jesus, but, but this one doesn't seem to. Uh, and so here's my response. Please turn in your Bibles one more time. I told you I was going get to you, get you moving around your Bible today. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Uh, starting in verse 30. Romans 9, 30. Um, and if you've been tracking with me through this message, and with all these page turns in your Bible, this is where I just think this gets awesome. Okay? Uh, this is where... The, the Lord just blew my mind as I was studying this text in preparation to bring it to you. Romans 9, verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. Gentiles are not Jews, right? They're, there's Jews and there's Gentiles. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers, this is 
the Apostle Paul speaking still, it, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, talking about the Jewish people, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they do not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What was Israel's problem? They loved the law. They loved the Old Testament. That wasn't the problem. But they wanted the law, they wanted the Old Testament without Jesus. That's the problem. They thought they could keep the law on their own. Earn their own righteousness through their own merits. But Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes, Paul tells us. Then Paul continues in verse 5. He says, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them, but righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How does salvation happen? Paul tells us, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Who can get salvation without Jesus? No one. What good then is our preaching and our proclamation if it does not lead to righteousness and salvation? Great, you might say, Pastor Clint, but what does that have to do with Psalm 19? Well, I'm really glad you asked because I'm not done yet. We're going to keep reading verses 14 through 18. Check this out. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And then check this out. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed, they have. Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. That sounds familiar. should sound familiar. Verse 18 there. That's from Psalm 19, verse 4. Paul's quoting the Old Testament there. Why does he quote Psalm 19, verse 4 here? Admittedly, Paul's logic in places through this chapter is difficult to follow, but I want to simplify it for you here as best I can by just simply saying that what Paul means is that you can't know, you can't understand the Creator that's spoken of back in Psalm 19, where Paul's quoting from, you can't know that Creator unless you know Jesus. Because the Creator in Psalm 19 is Jesus. So you, you, you can't understand the real meaning of Psalm 19 unless you understand that it anticipates the Gospel, that it points us forward to the Gospel message of Jesus Christ. So, so any faithful Christian treatment of Psalm 19 is going to teach it in such a way that it doesn't make sense unless the Gospel is true. If Psalm 19 is true, whether or not Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead on the third day, then Psalm 19 doesn't belong in the Christian Bible. Friends, I I hope you can understand how provocative those statements are, but they are true, and I stand by them 100%. The, The Jews had tried to do the Old Testament without Jesus. That's why they failed, Paul tells us. And so many Christian churches today, too, try to do their ministry with little or no mention of Jesus Christ. 
But friends, he has to be at the center of everything that we do. Let me say this one more time. Any faithful Christian treatment of Psalm 19 is going to teach it in such a way that it does not make sense unless the gospel is true. If we can teach Psalm 19 without any mention of Jesus and without any mention of the, of the gospel, then Psalm 19 doesn't belong in our Bibles. And this is where I just have to turn back to our series title, Why Do We Do That? Why do we center everything on the gospel? There's a lengthy quote. You'll find it in your bulletin. It was too long to put on the screens. From Charles Spurgeon. I think he, he conveys this really well. This is a famous quotation. <clears throat> but this is what he says. Spurgeon says, I believe that those sermons which are fullest of Christ are most likely to be blessed to the conversion of the hearers. Let your sermons be full of Christ from beginning to end, crammed full of the gospel. As for myself, brethren, I cannot preach anything else but Christ and his cross, for I know nothing else. And long ago, like the Apostle Paul, I determined not to know anything else save Jesus Christ and him crucified. People have often asked me, what is the secret of your success? I always answer that I have no other secret but this, that I have preached the gospel, not about the gospel, but the gospel, the full, free, glorious gospel of the living Christ who is the incarnation of the good news. Preach Jesus Christ, brethren, always and everywhere and every time you preach, be sure to have much of Jesus Christ in the sermon. You remember the story of the old minister who heard a sermon by a young man? And when he was asked by the preacher what he thought of it, he was rather slow to answer. But at last he said, if I must tell you, I did not like it at all. There was no Christ in your sermon. No, said the young man, because I did not see Christ was in the text. Oh, said the old minister, but do you not know that from every little town and village and tiny hamlet in England, there is a road leading to London? Whenever I get hold of a text, I say to myself, there is a road from here to Jesus Christ, and I mean to keep on his track till I get to him. Well, said the young man, but suppose you are preaching from a text that says nothing about Christ. Then I will go over hedge and ditch, but what I will get at him. So must we do, brethren. We must have Christ in all our discourses, whatever else is in or not in them. There ought to be enough of the gospel in every sermon to save a soul. Take care that it is so. When you are called to preach before Her Majesty the Queen, and if you have to preach to chairwomen or chairmen, still always take care that there is the real gospel in every sermon. Amen. All of this in mind, in our closing moments, the message here, let me tell you what I should have said as a herald of the Christian gospel from Psalm 19. You can turn back there if if you have your Bible there still. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. You want to talk about natural revelation? I'll simply say with the Apostle Paul, the natural revelation is Jesus Christ's revelation about himself in nature. He is the creator. He is the Lord of all creation and worthy of our praise. Because of sin, it's still true. The natural revelation does not get through, so we need special revelation. And we should recognize first as Christians that we always read the Old Testament through a New Testament lens. Okay, again, I'm going back to the lens language. We need to put on our New Testament glasses when we read the Old Testament. That's what the authors of the New Testament did. That's what Jesus himself did in Luke chapter 24. That's the prime example. I won't belabor that point any further. Not only does the Old Testament anticipate and foreshadow the promise of the coming of the Messiah in the New Testament, its truth depends on the gospel that he preached. That's true in general, but I want to spell it out as clearly as possible for us here in Psalm 19. It's, it's plain. In verse 7, first part of verse 7, how? How does the law of the Lord make us perfect? It's through the gospel. How can I say that? Well, the law was given to us to show us how sinful we are, wasn't it? But because we have been united to Christ by faith in the gospel, we are just as perfect, just as blameless, actually, as Jesus himself. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ, God in human form, lived perfectly under God's law. And he died as a substitute to pay for me, to pay for my sin. 
take my punishment, and when I trust in his righteousness and in his goodness and not in my own, I am saved from the punishment of my sin. So now, get this, rather than killing me, which is what the law would do apart from Christ, the law actually works to revive me, as it says there in verse 7. In the second part of verse 7, why is the testimony of the Lord sure? Well, it's because Jesus actually saved us, just as was promised in the Old Testament. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, all of the prophecies about the Messiah would have been proven untrue, and God would be a liar. Psalm 19 is only true if Jesus rose from the dead, only if the gospel is true. Still in verse 7, how does God make wise the simple? It's through the gospel. Verse 8, how does God see us as right or as in line with his precepts? It's through the gospel. Again, the Father sees us as righteous just as righteous as Jesus himself. If Jesus had failed to obey his Father by going to the cross, then we would still be in our sin and Psalm 19 would not be true. Still in verse 8, do I really need to ask how it is that our hearts are made to rejoice? I pray they're rejoicing right now. It's always through the gospel. How how does God enlighten our eyes to see him clearly? It's through the gospel. Verse 9, how exactly does God cause us to fear him in a way that makes us ceremonially clean before him? It's through the gospel. Verses 9 through 11, many, many today despise God's word as false and potentially dangerous. How do we come to know that God's word is true? How do we actually come to love God's word, to love a book more than gold? How are we motivated to obedience to God? It's through the gospel. Verses 12 and 13, how are we made aware of our sinfulness? And then how are we preserved from great sinfulness? Both are accomplished through the gospel. Verse 14, what is the only way that I can be made acceptable before God? There is only one way, and it is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Still in verse 14, And it is only through the gospel that my beloved Jesus has become my rock and my redeemer. Oh, brothers and sisters of Hingham Church, never, never, never lose sight of the gospel message. Psalm 19 is only true if Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and mine. In fact, the whole Old Testament is only true if the gospel is true. Do you see it yet? The only life that is worth living is a life that is centered on the gospel. If you have not personally yet believed the gospel, then you do not know this Jesus of whom I have been speaking. And if you don't know him, then he has not saved you from the punishment that is coming your way for your sin, for your breaking of God's laws. And if that describes you, Please don't leave here today without believing in Jesus, trusting Him to save you from your sins. If I can be of any help to you, please seek me out. Dear friends, the the, the Bible and the gospel that it proclaims is better than honey. It's better than all the pleasures of the world. It's better than gold or all the money in the world. Make Jesus the center of your life in every way. Keep him at the center of every work of ministry that you do with your church family. Talk about Jesus every day with your family at home. Don't allow yourself to get distracted by worldly things, to be moved off of that center. Make every aspect of your life so depend on the gospel of Jesus Christ that were the gospel not true, you could not do that thing. Find Christ everywhere he may be found. Please pray. Father in heaven, may you make every hope we have to depend on Jesus Christ. Make him the light of our eyes. Strengthen us through faith in the gospel. Give us enough joy that we can't help but sing about Jesus. Give us 
faithfulness to stand for the truth of the gospel, no matter what storms may come at us in this world. Teach us again of the heights and depths of Christ's love for us in His life, death, resurrection, and comfort us from this moment into eternity with the forgiveness that we have found in Jesus. Keep the gospel always in our hearts and in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of the gospel, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Will you please stand and now let's sing together about this glorious Christ. <clears throat> commands. 
Testing, testing. OK, can you guys hear me a little bit in the back? Yes, kind of, sort of. He's going to boost the volume, so I'll just talk loud for a sec. Uh, so we do have several today who would like to, uh, as a part of centering their lives on Jesus Christ, uh, would like to uh, make their uh, commitment to Jesus known. And uh, we have a couple here today, Kelsey Dolmus and Rachel Stocktick. Um, and each of the elders uh, uh, that are going to be speaking on their behalf. As a church, we make a provision for those who have been baptized at an early age to, and come later to salvation through personal faith in Jesus Christ to confirm these beliefs publicly when they're old enough to do so. So each of these individuals has been baptized. Each has gone through our membership procedures. Uh, the elders have heard and believe their professions of faith, and we would now like to say a few things to celebrate how the Lord Jesus has worked in each of their lives to the extent that they desire from the heart to publicly identify with him today. Well, I have the privilege of introducing Kelsey Dalmas to you this morning. And Kelsey's parents are Kurt and Michelle Dalmas. And Kelsey has an older sister, Morgan, who lives in western Wisconsin, I believe. In Arizona, my apologies. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, this fall, she plans on going to Northwestern College in Iowa to pursue a career in nursing. Her b favorite Bible verse is Matthew 17, 20. For truly I say it to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Um, Kelsey, we had the privilege of uh, getting to know Kelsey in uh, Heidelberg Catechism study in freshman year, so it was, it was a real joy to uh, get to know her and what an um, um, uh, example in Christ that she has grown to be. So. Well, today I have the honor to introduce you to Rachel Stadek, and I'm very happy that she has decided to dedicate her life to Jesus Christ and to join us in our mission here at Hingham Church. Rachel has grown up here, uh, and her parents are Bob and Liz. She also has two sisters, Laura and Cassie. Rachel's favorite scripture comes from Ephesians 4, chapter 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. I have to say that this is also one of my favorite verses, and one that we can all commit to together. Some of Rachel's favorite things are going horseback riding and shooting air rifle. So make sure you get permission before you go on her property. <laughs> she will also be attending UW-Platteville in the fall and working on a degree in engineering. God bless you, Rachel, and we look forward to worshiping alongside you. Thank you. Well, thank you, elders. Um, so, uh, to those of you publicly identifying with Christ today, I just want to say a few things, uh, some words from our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. He also says in another place, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus Christ has chosen you. And in baptism has set his great and glorious promises upon you. He has called you together with us into the church, which is his body. Now he has brought you to this time and place and has given you the faith and desire that you may confess his name publicly and go out and serve him as faithful disciples. Now, Kelsey and Rachel, I have a couple of questions to ask about your faith, and I'll ask that you respond together in the, in the appropriate places. So first, simple question. 
Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins and was raised on the third day? If so, please say, I do. Do you trust in Christ alone for forgiveness and hope of eternal life? By God's grace, do you intend to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to proclaim Christ's glory? If so, please say, I do. Awesome. Praise God. Uh, Now, Kelsey and Rachel, upon your public profession of faith, we do now acknowledge your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and his saving grace in your life that was foreshadowed in your baptism and has now been received by grace through faith. He has chosen you. He has commissioned you. Live in this love and serve him. There are others today who uh, will uh, publicly, uh, who have already, excuse me, publicly identified with Jesus Christ in other contexts, uh, but who have been led by the Lord to pursue membership here at Hingham Church. And so at this time, I want to invite Eric Albrecht, Joel and Sheila up near, and Rich and Karen Tenhaken up here to the front, please. <clears throat> Each of these individuals who are joining me uh, have uh, made already several commitments to Hingham Church. Um, New members, I'm going to ask seven questions of you, and then uh, I'm going to ask you at the end to respond all together to those questions. So, new members, uh, do you commit to faithful, regular attendance and participation in worship with the intention of being present, being known, and being active? Do you commit to investment in a smaller group within the church with the intention of actively and consistently participating as you are able? Do you commit to the attitudes and actions of service with the intention of partnering with the church as a provider, not a consumer, and pursuing ministry in your home, church community, and to the ends of the earth? Do you commit to the maintenance of peace and unity in the congregation with the intention of pursuing reconciliation and demonstrating forgiveness whether you have sinned or been sinned against? Do you commit to supporting the work of the ministry with the intention of giving regularly, cheerfully, generously, and sacrificially of your money, time, energy, and spiritual gifts? And do you commit to submitting to the leadership of Hingham Church with the intention of surrendering your own preferences and desires, instead pursuing the good of the whole for the advancement of the gospel? And do you commit to prayer for Hingham Church, with the intention of regularly praying for the elders, pastors, members, and ministry of the church. Will you now affirm these commitments publicly? If so, please say, by God's grace, I do. Great. Can I ask if you're a member of Hingham Church today, a current member, would you please stand? I have a question for you as well. Do you, the members of Hingham Church, commit to these individuals to receive them warmly into our local body, to uphold them in your prayers and to serve and encourage them and to sustain them and their families in the fellowship of believers? If so, please say, by God's grace, we do. Please pray with me. Almighty God, by the love of Jesus Christ, you draw people to yourself and you welcome them into the household of faith. May we show your joy by embracing new brothers and sisters as we bear your creative and redeeming word to all the world. Keep us close together in your spirit, in the breaking of bread, in the prayers, and in service to others, following the example of Jesus Christ, our servant and Lord. Amen. Could we welcome all of these new members into our body today with a round of applause? You guys are dismissed. Thanks. Go ahead. Thank you. They're being sent out to the narthex. uh, And and would everybody now please stand uh, together as I send us out with a benediction. After the benediction, I just want to encourage you. 
uh, to go and make your way through the narthex. If you would take a couple minutes to do that, welcome these new members into our body officially with a, a warm handshake or a hug or depending on your COVID level of comfort, maybe just a, a wave or I don't know, whatever, whatever you feel like doing to make them feel welcome. All right, but this is, uh, this is our benediction today. It's taken from Jude, chapter, or Jude uh, verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go in grace and peace.